This is section 5.2, the definite integral, our fifth and final objective for the section, and it is to use the rules for definite integrals to answer questions involving integrals. And I want you to be able to explain why the additivity rule for definite integrals makes sense. If we look at this, we have multiple rules for definite integrals. So I'm just going to put them up here so that you see them. There are seven of them. We've got order of integration, the zero rule, constant multiple, sum and difference, additivity, maximum inequality and domination. We're going to go through each of these one at a time and then you'll see how they interact with each other when we're solving problems. Our first rule of definite integrals is called the order of integration and it says if we accumulate from b to a on f of x with respect to x that accumulation will be the opposite of the accumulation of f of x with respect to x. To understand why we need to think about the fact that this definite integral is in reality a Riemann sum and we've taken the limit of it. And if we think about what this is representing, it's y coordinates times a delta x. So graphically, if I'm starting at b and ending at a, then in order to get from b to a, I have to move left. That means my delta x will have to be a negative change in x. Since we're integrating in the opposite direction and x is getting smaller from b to a, then our delta x is negative, which means this will be the opposite of the original. Our second rule is the zero property, and it says if I accumulate from a to a on f with respect to x, I get nothing. If we think graphically about this, that means we're accumulating under a single point. So how much area is beneath that point? Absolutely none. Next is the constant multiple rule. If we again think graphically about this, this says if I have a function and I multiply it by k, so all of the y values are becoming k times as large, and then I accumulate, I'm going to get the exact same result as if I accumulate first and then multiply by k. Thinking graphically, the accumulation here would be one number, whereas if I multiply all my y values by k, I have taken this accumulation and multiplied it by k. Every vertical dimension got multiplied by k, so then the area will also be multiplied by k. Fourth is the sum and difference rule. This one says if I have two functions that are added together and then I accumulate them, I'm going to get the same result as if I accumulate them separately and then add. And the same works for subtraction. To see this graphically, I could accumulate this f and accumulate this g and add those two numbers together, and I will get the same as the accumulation when I add the two functions together first. With my additivity property, it says if I accumulate from a to b, and then I pick back up again at b and continue on to c, then I didn't really need to stop at all, and it will be the same as if I accumulated from a all the way to c. So graphically, here's that accumulation from a to b, then I add the accumulation from b to c. Notice that I'm shading the same regions as if I just accumulated from a to c. Rule number six is the max min inequality. If I label max f as the maximum value on f and min f as the minimum value in, of f on the interval from a to b, then I can create rectangles that have the minimum f as its height or the maximum f as its height. And notice that if I now graph the accumulation under the function, it will be trapped between the two, which is exactly what this property says. The true accumulation is trapped between the minimum y value times the length of the interval, or the area of that small rectangle down here, and the area of the large rectangle, which was the maximum y value times the width. Lastly is our domination. This one says if f is greater than g, in other words, if the y coordinates on f are always above the y coordinates on g, then the accumulation of f will be larger than the accumulation on g. So we can see that graphically. Here's our accumulation on g. Since g is positive, we know the accumulation is the same as the area. And since f is above g all the time, its area or its accumulation will be larger. Now this particular line here is just a special case. If g happens to be the horizontal line y equals 0 and f is greater than that, 
in other words the outputs on F are always positive then the accumulation must also be positive. With example 1 now we can see that if we suppose negative 1 to 1 on F gives me 5 and the accumulation from 1 to 4 of F with respect to X gives me negative 2 and the accumulation from negative 1 to 1 on H with respect to X gives me 7 then I can find each of the following using these properties. So if I want to accumulate from 4 backwards to 1, that's going to be the opposite of the accumulation from 1 to 4, which I t was told is negative 2. So it'll be the opposite of negative 2, which is 2. If I want to go from negative 1 to 4, I need to look for things that start or end at negative 1 and things that start or end at 4 on the function f and I need to see if I'm stopping and starting at the same place. Because I am, I can use the additivity property and say I want to accumulate from negative 1 to 1 and then continue accumulation until 4. Because these two numbers match, I can condense them and get the same thing and have 5 plus negative 2 which is 3. If I look at part c, I want to go from negative 1 to 1 on F and H. So I can use the fact that adding will allow me to split and multiplying by a constant and then accumulating is the same as accumulating first and then multiplying. So I fill in what I know. I have 2 times the accumulation on F is 5 plus 3 times the accumulation on H is 7. I get 10 plus 21 gives me 31. If I look at my final one, this says I want to accumulate from 0 to 1, and I don't have any zeros anywhere, so I cannot figure this out. With example 2 now, I'm told that if going from negative 3 to 2 on F gives me 6, and going from 2 to 1 on F gives me 11, and I want negative 3 to 1, then I can use the fact that these two are connected, and they have the same ending space and starting spot, so I can add those together. Negative 3 to 2 on F plus 2 to 1 on F will give me 6 plus 11, which will also give me that negative 3 to 1 on f of x. So I can see that my accumulation will be 17. With example 3 now, there are two ways that I can approach this. I can do it completely analytically or I can do it graphically. So let's start with the analytical version. I want to know what's the accumulation from a to b of that f of x plus 5. So what I can do is analytically break this into two pieces. I can say that's the same as the accumulation from a to b of f plus the accumulation from a to b of 5. I know this accumulation is a plus 2b, and based on what I learned earlier, I know that accumulating a constant will just give me that constant times the length of the interval. So I end up with a plus 2b plus 5b minus 5a. Simplify, I will end up with a negative 4a plus a 7b. Now the other variation is I can think graphically. If I think graphically, I have some function and I'm accumulating from a until b. And this accumulation here is an a plus 2b. Now if I add 5 to the outside of the function, what that's going to do is it's going to take that same picture and move it up 5 units. So what used to be my axis here is now going to be 5 units higher. So this area here will be 5 times the length of the interval, whereas this accumulation before it got moved up was a plus 2b. Put those together and we end up with the same answer. With example 4, this one tests whether or not we know our properties or our rules for definite integrals. So if we look here, this says I'm going to start at 2 and end up at A, and the question is, is that the same as if I start at 2, go to B, and then continue on from B to A? Well, this is our additivity rule, so this one is true. The next one says, if I have a function and I multiply every y-coordinate by 3 and then accumulate, am I going to get the same thing as if I accumulate f originally and then multiply by 3? Well, hopefully you recognize that this is just your constant multiple rule, and this one is also true. 
our third and final version says if a goes to b on f of x squared plus f prime with respect to x, do we get f of b squared minus, mm, this doesn't look like anything we've seen before, so that one is not one that we can assume is true.